uh, take a crack at how you pronounce her name, Onoso Imoagani, I think. Um, I, I kind of cheated right there. I think I heard her talking to you and saying that, Robert. Uh, she's an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of Pennsylvania, where, by the way, in Pittsburgh, they have a face recognition buffet. Yes, they uh, do. <laughs> and she's written a book called Beyond Expectations, Second Generation Nigerians in the United Nations and Britain. This is a, a topic, uh, you know what, we try to get something new. And if you, th- we've never talked about this. This is definitely a new topic for us. Uh, Onoso Imoagni, uh, first of all, I apologize if I'm saying your name incorrectly. And good morning. Thank you for being on the air with us. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning to you, too. Thank you for having me on. Uh, where are you? Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Philadelphia. Philadelphia. <laughs> yes. Everything's in Pennsylvania today. Oh, my gosh. How's the weather in, in, in Pennsylvania? It's cool. It's a bit overcast, but it's not bad at all. Oh, okay, okay. I love your accent. So you, uh, is your accent from, um, from, from Nigeria? Am I right? Yes, I guess you would say it's from Nigeria, though I have been about. I studied in England for a year before coming to the U.S., so oh. sometimes people say that flavors into my accent. Oh, I hear. Yeah, I do hear both. I hear Nigerian and I hear, <laughs> I hear British also. Uh, well, so tell, are you a second-generation Nigerian yourself? No, I'm first generation. I came into the U.S. and as an adult. Oh, okay, okay. So your children will be second generation. Yes. Ah, yes. okay. And, and and is the book about what that generation is experiencing? Yeah, so that's I wanted to study the adult children, so I wanted 22 years and over, you know, they finished school, they started setting up their own households. I really wanted to see how they were faring in, in the United States and in Britain. Okay. And is it different? Is, the, is, is their experience in the United States different than it would be in Britain? Yes, I was really surprised about that, especially on the issue of national identity, because I, I, start, I had these questions in my interview schedule, what does being American mean to you, what does being British mean to you, right, and right. do you think of yourself as American and British? And surprisingly enough, when I was in Britain, you know, I asked them the question and they would laugh and say, oh, being British means nothing to me, or, you know, they don't really know how to answer that. So I found out that those in Britain weren't really identifying strongly with Britain at all compared to the people in the U.S. who were waxing poetic about what it meant to be American. It means freedom, opportunity, yeah, yeah, American yeah. dream. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so it was very interesting to see that divide. Is there an explanation as to why that is? Yeah, I think I started really looking at it, and I believe that um, Britain's colonial history with um, Nigeria, because Nigeria was an ex- is an ex-colony of Britain, I think that really had something to do with it, because they had this view that Britain had exploited Nigerians and people from its colonies in the past, and is doing something similar to its immigrants now, especially because they really do not like um, black immigrants coming from wherever they might be coming from, Caribbean or from Africa. Uh-huh. Uh huh. And and so, um, are you? Do you feel a, a sense of nationality with with the United States or, or with Britain? Um, I'm I'm an American citizen now, so I do feel very American. And again, you know, talking to the people, I think one of the things that came clear is that as children of black immigrants, black immigrants and their kids are also um, beneficiaries of affirmative action policies, especially as they're going into university. And so that really helps them form this belief that America is the land of dreams and, and you can achieve. And so um, that's something that strengthens your feeling that America is more open, you can, you can achieve more in the U.S., yes. When you speak to um, uh, other immigrants uh, from other areas of the world, uh, let's say from mm-hmm. Europe or from Asia, do their mm-hmm. second generation uh, um, descendants have the same experience? You know, that's one of the things that's unique about my study in that it's comparative. It's studying um, the second generation in two nations. And so that's why I was able to tease out some of these national differences. Right. Because a lot of right. scholarship on children of immigrants tends to focus on just one country. And, and so there's a lot of work about Asian second generation in, in the United States. And they also feel American. So you have Asian Americans. Yeah. Right, right. But I just found the, the book online. So I, I 
put the cover of the book on on the uh, video that we're doing right now uh, on it'll be on YouTube later on right now it's on Ustream but but let me ask, are those the the folks in the in the photo are they related to you or are they just is, are they models <laughs> no actually um the guy standing up is um is related to me um and the others are his friends so i was told my editor at uc press university of california press told me uh -huh. she wanted a picture of um nigerian professionals in an office setting because i was talking about how so how they're doing well how successful they are oh, that, that's the title is that your son and so he had to no, 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 no. That's my sister's husband. Oh, okay, okay. So he had to organize his friends together to help me take a picture because there wasn't a stock photo I could access. Oh, okay. Uh, and, and how are <laughs> and how are they doing? I mean, do are they are they embracing the education opportunities, or, or does that is that not part of what you are focusing on? I do focus on that, and they're doing well, you know. Um, as I was thinking about different titles for the book, I think one time I, was, I had a title called The Success Story. And so the Nigerian second generation are doing well, and I think it's really linked to the fact that they are, their parents, the so first generation Nigerians, are extremely educa well educated in the U.S. and in Britain. You know, Nigerians are one of the most educated immigrant groups in the two countries, to the extent that about two out of every three Nigerians has at least a bachelor's degree. And so one of the things that got me interested in this topic was I wanted to see if this educational advantage of the first generation was passing on to their kids. Right. And, and it is. They are, they are embracing the educational opportunities. They really have no choice. And, and does, it, um, does it translate into earning power? Are they, are they earning better livings than they might have otherwise? Well, they are earning well because they're professionals. And again, they are, as, as children of Nigerian immigrants, as those born in the U.S., you can't really compare them with people living back in Nigeria. But they are medical doctors, they are lawyers, they are doing, they are doing, they are doing quite well. Uh, uh, oh, no, so uh, I should have asked you this first thing. Did I pronounce your name correctly? Well, you are close. It's Onoso. Onoso? Im Im yeah. Imoagani, is that right? Imwagini. Yes, Imwagini. you are close. Imwagini, okay. Onoso yeah. Imwagini, yeah. okay. Uh, Onoso yeah. Imwagini is our guest. Her, uh, her book is called Beyond Expectations, Second Generation Nigerians in the United States and Britain. And I do have a cover, the cover of the book on the, the podcast that we're doing right now. So you can get it, uh, I guess, on Amazon. Did, I, I'm guessing, that, when did the book come out? It came out in February, but that's when the press said it had come out, but it wasn't available till March till late March. That's when it got onto Amazon.com. It's getting nice reviews, too. I see five stars on Amazon. Oh, nice. Nice. Oh, you that's did, you always, that always makes me happy. <laughs> <laughs> that makes you happy it's when people are positively um, they are receiving your book in a good way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just seems that... Uh, um, Years ago, there was more attention paid to the class of the person and the fraternization, you know, among the classes. But now it seems like that barrier has disappeared. Do you think it has? I mean, even though there are people that have, a, at, at least in our community, a, a lot of money and people that don't have so much money, they all seem to get along and don't use that as a barrier. Oh, uh, well, I think um, for my respondents, it depends on who, which group you're looking at. So I would say that among this Nigerian second generation, they do agree, I'm talking now about black-on-black -black relations, they do agree that they have a lot in common with other middle-class blacks, be they African-American or Caribbean. But there seems to be a class cleavage emerging between middle-class blacks and, and the poorer blacks. And it's it's something I found among my respondents, but even people who study black people, African Americans in the U.S. are finding similar things. Yeah, yeah, it, it is interesting, isn't it? it? Is life in Nigeria um, different? Let's say in in some of the other. Well, obviously, it would be different than the other countries. But in what way is it different? And in what way do the differences of Nigeria affect the way life is for you in America or in Britain? 
Oh, yeah, life in Nigeria is definitely different. I think, um, as I mentioned earlier, the Nigerians you meet here in the United States and Britain are the cream of the crop. They are the best and the brightest. Where um, out of adults, Nigerians, two out of three have at least a bachelor's. Back in Nigeria, just 7% of the adult population has at least a bachelor's. So already you're seeing that it's the elite, it's an elite slice that really tends to be in the diaspora. I think another thing that makes it different is that back in Nigeria, we think in terms of, you know, um, Yoruba, um, Igbo, we think in terms of our ethnic group memberships or um, Muslim or um, Christian, you know, we don't really think of Nigerian as the ethnicity. And that's something that is really different oh, when you oh, come really? to the U.S. and Britain. Yeah, so now everybody, Nigerian is the ethnicity here in in these countries, but it's really not that way back home. Oh, wow. I, that, yeah, I never would have known that. Um, we do the show live, and that means we have listeners who call in. Are you okay with taking phone calls? Sure, that's fine. Okay, let me go to the phone. Uh, uh, Onoso Imwagni, I hope I said that right that time, uh, is our guest. Yep. Beyond Expectations is the book. Let's say good morning to one of our listeners. Good morning, you're on the air. Good morning. I'd like to ask the um, the author um, where she grew up in Nigeria, what area, and her English is incredible. Is English um, taught in the schools where she grew up? How did she learn English so well? Did her parents know English? Uh, just to comment a little on that. All right. Uh, all right. I, um, I grew up in Ibado in Nigeria, so that's in the south. So I grew up among the Yorubas. And I, because my, Nigeria is was once a colony of Britain, we speak English. English is our official language. I think we found out that that's the way to keep unity. Because if there are two, we have 250 ethnic groups in Nigeria. Our question was, which group language would be the national language? There was no group that was going to agree that, you know, you choose that language and you don't choose mine. Right. And so that's why English is the, is the official language. English is the language used to teach, teach in schools. Um, it's our language of instruction. It's our language of business. Um, my parents um, spoke English very well. My father was um, a professor also of sociology um, at the University of Ibadan. So um, that's the reason why um, I speak English um, well. Okay. Any a follow-up question? Oh, she's not there anymore. I, 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 didn't, I don't even know Nigeria. I had to go on Google while you were talking to see uh, if, what the... Ah! <laughs> I mean, I knew where Nigeria was, but I don't know the cities or the regions in Nigeria. So that, that I guess that plays a, an important role on, for somebody like yourself, right? Yes, yes. Nigeria, I mean, I think Nigeria, if we tend to think everybody knows about Nigeria, right? As they were the most populous black nation in the world. Um, and, and there's a, a term they describe us that we are the Jews of Africa because you find us in almost every, Af every almost every country. I'm sure I would say every country in the world has a Nigerian somewhere. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. When, but the regions make a difference, yes. When uh, you did the research for your book, you did a lot of interviews. Uh, how did you select the people that you interviewed and were they wary at first of being interviewed for a project like this? Yeah, yeah. I interviewed them, um, 150 individuals, 75 in each country. And so I really started, I, I wanted to sort of start with a random sample. So I told my advisor that, oh, yeah, I'm going to try and cold call people off the phone books, you know, just look through the phone books, identify Nigerian names and call them. And it was a terrible experience because <laughs> they were so wary and so hostile. They were like, where did you get that number? Who are you calling? And, and and I realized also I wasn't getting the children. I was getting first-generation Nigerians. And so um, I decided to go to the embassy. So I went to the New York consulate, the cons Nigerian consulate in New York and the embassy in London. And, and so I got permission to sit there, and then I had this screening questionnaire that I'll ask, I'll pass on to the people and say, please fill it out for me so that I could identify those individuals who had been born in the United States and Britain or who came very young. And so that was the, the main way I got my respondents in the, on the UK side. Um, and it was, yeah, yeah, I think what I found out was that first generation Nigerian immigrants, when I approached them with my questionnaire, they are more hostile. The second generation were more gracious, more willing to be interviewed. Um, I, yeah, yeah. And I want to ask about that hostility. Why? 
what are they hostile about? I, I, and and I guess the, the second question to go along with that same one, are the, the second generation uh, Nigerians who are living here and in Britain, are they more likely to want to forget, oh, not forget, but disassociate themselves with their roots? No, not at all. Starting with the second question, no. Uh -huh, what okay. I found was this great, I, I talk about how they are choosing ethnicity and negotiating race. So they really hold strongly to what they call their Nigerian values and, and, and really talk about how that has served as the core of who they are while they bring on other elements of British culture or American culture. So I didn't find uh, uh, really a lot of people trying to run away from being Nigerian. They were quite proud of it. Um, in terms of being suspicious, I guess it's part of life in Nigeria, right, where you feel that, you know, people might take advantage of you. What are they, why do they want your name or your number? But that, as I said, was I found that to be more prevalent among those who had grown up in Nigeria and knew what that was all about compared to the children born in the U.S. and Britain who were more sheltered. Mm, okay, okay. Um, the, the book, again, is called Beyond Expectations. We have to take a little break, so let me do the break right now, and then when we come back, we'll uh, get more information about the book, how we can get it, and um, what life is like. If you're listening and you are a second-generation Nigerian, I would love to have you call in. The number is 622-9622. Onoso Imwagni is on the phone and um, up in Philadelphia, where every story is coming from today for some reason. We will take a little break and be right back. Broadcasting from the Paddock Mall Studios, this is WOCA, Ocala, Gainesville, The Villages, 1370 AM, 96.3 FM, The Source. The weather is brought to you by MyFWC.com. Safe boating is no accident. Fair amount of clouds with thunderstorms around during the afternoon hours. A high of 84 to 86. Thunder showers will die out this evening. Then clouds tonight with a low of 70 to 73. Partly sunny tomorrow with a thunderstorm in the afternoon. A high of 87 to 89. Mostly afternoon thunderstorms for Sunday with some sun and highs of 87 to 90. From the Florida Weather Center, I'm meteorologist Maggie Johnson. Here's what you may have missed on the John Tesh Radio Show. Number two on the summer danger list is trampolines. Yeah. Try to get insurance if you have a trampoline in your house. Time to amp up our brain power. And did you know that taking an afternoon nap can make you smarter? Only post one picture of your dog, your baby, or a sunset, not a series. Pulitzer Prize winning photojournalist David Hume Kennerly says, quote, I get annoyed when people post 10 pictures of their cat when one would have been enough. Intelligence for your life on the John Tesh Radio Show. Don't miss this stuff. Coming this and every second Friday of the month at 11 a.m. is Trinity Healthcare Medical Center with your host, Dr. David Kuhn. Trinity Healthcare Medical Center is Ocala's only progressive primary care clinic. Be sure to listen in and also check their website at thcmc.com. Then call them with your questions at 512-0000. That's 512-0000. That's every second Friday at 11 a.m. for Trinity Healthcare Medical Center here on The Source, WOCA. All right, seven minutes before 10 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, if you're watching the video, the streaming video, you see the cover of the book Beyond Expectations. It is written by our guest, Onoso Imoagni. I think I'll get it right by the time I get done with this interview. Uh, I wanted to tell you something that I think you're confirming for me. I've had a theory, uh, Onoso, I've had a theory that yeah. um, when, when your ancestors are from Europe, um, nobody says I'm a European American. You usually say German American, or, or well, a lot of people don't even use the hyphenated thing. But just for the sake of this conversation, I'm Italian American. I'm a, uh, right. do you know what I mean? Or, or I don't know if anybody yeah. says British American. I don't never heard anybody say that. Mm -hmm. But nobody from Africa ever does that. They would say African American. It's a huge continent. And my theory has always been. Wouldn't wouldn't you say Nigerian American instead of African American? Because yes. wouldn't that the food and the music and the culture of Nigeria, for example, uh, be way different than from the other countries in in Africa, especially the ones that are not close to Nigeria? Yeah, well, I guess it starts with um, um, black people who have been in the United States for um, centuries, right, and have the history the longer history in the U.S., they termed themselves African-American, though at a point in time they were also known as Black American, right? And right, the name right. changed in, around the 80s. 
And so it's the new is the new immigrants now, the new black immigrants and their children, let's call them post nineteen sixty five, right? Who are still trying to keep this bring in this hyphenated I'm Nigerian American, I'm Ghanaian American, you know, I'm, right. I'm, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm Jamaican American. So they are the ones who are holding on who are using this hyphenated identity again, as you rightly said, because they are making an argument that um their culture is different, that they are different from African-Americans who they have met. Mm -hmm. But but, but I think most of the people that I know, whether they're black or white, are are mostly American. The word American is the bigger word in, in, Mm -hmm. in the following way. If I go to an Italian home, for example, Okay, they got a few customs, they got a few food dishes that they might have, but pretty much, mm-hmm. you know, they're working in the same jobs that, that everybody else is working, and, and the same thing is as an African American, the same thing, maybe they've got a few different cultural, maybe their religion is more different, uh, you know, maybe they go to a church where they sing a little bit louder, which I think that's probably what I've noticed. And, yes. But, but, uh, but other than that, it's, it's not, it's just, it's just a... I mean, we're, it's a good thing, I think, to have difference, cu- differences that are cultural. Right, yeah. And I, and I believe that the baseline, as you rightly said, is that everybody all identify as American. And so they're adding the, the prefix in front of that to, to, to link to their roots or to their ancestry. And, and not to get too sociological here, but people will argue, make an argument, scholars of race and ethnicity will make an argument that even though a lot of immigrant groups from Europe were able to assimilate smoothly and become American, you know, that um, historically African Americans have been seen as unassimilable and have been kept sort of separate. And that's one of the reasons well, why we have that African American uh, title. Okay. And how is that different in Britain? Is it different uh, in great in a great way or is it the same? Uh, in Britain, actually, I think they don't have that convention of hyphenated identities like we do here, Asian American, uh-huh. Hispanic, you know, they don't have that convention. And and, and so um, my respondents, it was quite interesting. I, did, I didn't get people telling me, oh, I'm Nigerian British. <laughs> oh, uh, right, right, oh, right, right. I, what they have for, for, for black people is, bl- is the title Black British, which includes black Caribbeans and black Africans and black other. Right, um, right. But even my respondents still didn't say black British. They basically took the Nigerian identity. Um, the book, again, is, is called uh, Beyond Expectations. Uh, with uh, like a minute left, how, how, where did the title come from? What, what is Beyond Expectations? Right. Well, the, the title, first of all, I think one of the main things I want people to take away from the book is that Nigerians are doing well, better than, than was expected or better than has been predicted for them. And I think that's where the title comes from, because in the scholarship on black immigrants and their children, there's this sense that the children won't do so well because yeah, of racial yeah. discrimination and because of proximity to blacks in the inner city and all that. And so my book is really saying, you know, we really have to spend some time thinking about how race intersects with class, the fact that their parents are quite selected and also with ethnicity. And so my t- title is basically saying they're doing much better than than our expectations that they will that they won't do well. Yeah, yeah. And it seems like there are a lot of uh universities that embrace uh the different cultures. Such yes, a big indeed. benefit. In- Yes, indeed, they do. And so that also gives them room to find themselves and to, to meet up with other people from similar you know, backgrounds. And, and, and that helps them um, to concretize a, a, an ethnic identity while still recognizing that they are black in the U.S. Um, let's see. I found the book on Amazon. I know you can get it there. How else do we get the book? Do you have a website you can direct us to? Yes, I have a website for the book. It's called beyondexpectationsbook.com. And, and so you can get on there. You, there's also some, I, there's an excerpt from the book you can read on there. You can get an e-copy of the book on the publisher's website, ucpress.edu. Um, and then also Barnes and & Nobles and some of the big books and um, bookstores also are carrying the book. Okay. Uh, and also, Imwagani, thank you so much for being on the air with us. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Having- thank you. All right, we'll be right back. Broadcasting from the Paddock Mall Studios, this is WOCA, Ocala, Gainesville, The Villages, 1370 AM, 96.3 FM, The Source. 
Fox News Radio. I'm Lillian Wu. The president tweeting, I am being investigated for firing the FBI director by the man who told me to fire the FBI director, witch hunt. Meanwhile, reports that as part of the Russia investigation, special counsel Robert Mueller is looking into finances of Jared Kushner, the president's son-in-law and advisor. Statement from the uh, Kushner outside attorney. We do not know what this report refers to. It would be standard practice for the special counsel to examine financial records to look for anything related to Russia. Fox's Kevin Cork. The congressional charity baseball game last night enjoying a